Thank you so much. The military community loves labels. Am I Luke Bouchard's wife? Am I an army wife? Am I a military spouse? Am I a unit spouse? Am I a career person? Am I a military.com executive editor? Figuring out what to call yourself is almost as hard as figuring out where to tell people you're from. It's impossible. On the one hand, I love being a military spouse. I'm really proud of that, and I want people to know that that's who I am when they ask, right? On the other hand, I'm also really proud of my career. I love my career, and I want people to know about that. And on the other hand, I really don't like labels at all because they're sort of barks you in and it's crazy. And now I have three hands and I don't even know what to do. Today, I'm really excited because we get to hear from somebody who's not only uh, experienced this problem herself, but has a great solution for it. The 2017 Military Spouse of the Year, Brittany Bacher, is here today to tell us how she deals with this. Please welcome her to the stage. All right, good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be here. It's such an honor to see so many familiar faces and new faces. Um, I am gonna try to take you through a 13-year journey, nine moves, in about 10 minutes, all right? So just let's try to get through this together. So um, first things first, military spouses, who are you? So are you a husband? Are you a wife? Are you a mother, a father? Are you employed, unemployed, underemployed? Um, maybe a student or a volunteer. But maybe you're a friend, a supporter, um, strong, independent, and adaptable. Um, understanding, proud, and supportive. We know we are resourceful and very committed. And some of us are outgoing and others are introverts. But we are all creative in our own ways and we are all extremely unique. We're passionate, motivated, and empowered individuals. But let's be real, we're tired. Sometimes we're angry. Sometimes we feel lost. But if at the end of the day, we can say we are content, we have won. So, um, what do we do when we identify ourselves? We typically say our circumstance helps identify who we are, how others perceive us to be, and by the roles that we play in our life. But we all know that you are you. There's only one of you. Nobody else is like you, and nobody else has walked the journey that you have walked. So you're actually a combination of the circumstance that you have experienced, the life moments, defined characteristics of who you are, your beliefs and values that you have had from the time you were born, um, your skills and abilities, and your experiences and the roles that you identify with. So I really like Dolly Parton, and I think she um, says it best when she says, find out who you are and do it on purpose. As much as I love Dolly, I would like to say, own who you are and be open to new possibilities and opportunities. So I'm gonna take you on my journey. In 2005, I graduated from college. I was working in what I thought was my dream job. I was extremely passionate, uh, motivated, was living life with purpose. I got up every day and would drive 63 miles one way to work. I loved it that much. Um, and at the end of the day, I was very happy. And life was going great. And then I go on a work trip and I get into an airport and I meet this guy. And I'm a pretty forward person, so I exchange business cards with this guy. And um, I would say it took about a month for him to contact me and he asked me on a date. So Mrs. Wilson is here and she knows. I was pretty committed because he asked me on a date to come from Houston, Texas to fly to Columbus, Mississippi. Anybody know where Columbus, Mississippi is at? All right, see, frequent in there. Um, so I did, I went on a date. My family thought I was crazy because I got on a plane to go on a date. And um, I started flying there every weekend. I changed my work schedule to working four tens so that I could fly on Fridays to Columbus, Mississippi via Atlanta. And um, six months went by and he asked me to marry him and I said yes. I'll marry you. And so we got married 
on my lunch break in a courthouse. How many have been there? All right, good, a few of us, we know about it. So we get married and um, about three days after getting married, he gets orders that says he's deploying. <laughs> Life just got real that moment. And um, I hadn't moved yet, I was still in Texas. He gets deployment orders. Um, so of course I'm not gonna like move to Columbus, Mississippi while he's you know going halfway around the world. And um, I realized for the first time in my life, like I was kind of scared. I was like, what's happening? You know, I, I get married to this man. Um, I don't have a support network. Nobody understands. You know, my friends are saying, oh yeah, yeah, my husband, um, he wanted on a work trip for two weeks. I'm like, awesome, is he getting shot at? Because it's probably not happening, you know? Um, scared, the phone rings, and you see that zero, 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 zero number, you know, and you're like, What's happening? Or you get that knock on the door and you don't want to go to the door because you're afraid of who's going to be on that side of the door. So nobody understood. I'm in Houston, Texas. There's no military base. Um, people are very patriotic there, but no military base in Houston. And so I was in this really rough spot. But of course, he came back and I love this man a whole bunch because I picked up and left Houston, Texas the job that I love, the family that I have, the network I knew, everything that was safe and good and true in my life, I left and I moved to Columbus, Mississippi. If you don't know Columbus, Mississippi, there's no Target, you have to drive to Alabama. There's no Starbucks, I think now there is, but there wasn't then. So talk about first world problems, right? Um, so I get to this town, very few um, even chain restaurants. It's mom and pops. If you want to go on a date night, you're going to Harvey's or Prophet's Porch. Um, but there was no, like, I'm going out to a five-star dining experience. If you want to stay, go to Old Hickory. So it was definitely a change in pace for me. It was a change in life. For the first time, I found my, myself struggling to make friends. I didn't know where to make friends. Um, I get on a military base and I was nervous when I saw somebody in a uniform because I didn't know anything about rank and what am I supposed to do? Like, do I stop? Do I let them walk? Do I salute? I don't know what I do. So, you know, I'm here and I feel like I need to be like put through like a course, you know, like really teaching me the ins and outs. Um, and I did what most military spouses experience. I struggled with employment. So I went from a big metropolitan city where I'm working my dream job making a pretty decent salary at 23, 24 years old, to Columbus, Mississippi, where um, there really wasn't a market for employment. So the options were not even Starbucks. I, nope, can't be a barista. Um, I was really struggling with what I was gonna do. And so I complained a lot. I made life miserable for my husband. Um, I, I complained, I dug my heels in, and for the first time in my life, I let a geographic location and a status dictate how I was living my life every day. Because I would get up every day and say, I can't get a job. Can't go to work, can't make friends, I hate it here, let's just move. That was the answer, right? So, um, we move. 2008, we get orders, so we head off to Colorado, and it's like, yes! We are going somewhere where it's like civilization. So um, we get to Colorado. We arrive in Colorado, three months, orders, drop, deployment. I'm like, okay, so my feet aren't wet in here. I have no friends yet. Boxes are still not unpacked in the house. And what do I say? I'm struggling, I can't fit in, my spouse is leaving, I'm angry, I'm resentful, I'm bitter, I'm going home. I'm gonna go home because that is what I thought was gonna answer all of my problems. So I pack it up. A house we just moved into, packed it up, put it in storage, went home for nine months. But you know what happened when I got home? Home wasn't home anymore. I got home and the same things I was feeling in the base, I was still feeling at home. I still had no resource, I still had no support network, even though I had all this family. Um, and I just, I didn't know. I didn't know what resources were there. And I just felt like I was still floundering and didn't know what I was doing. So that deployment, it was miserable. It was intense. Um, might as well have been just like Grand Canyon between us instead of the miles. It was a really rough time. 
And as a spouse, and as somebody who was very independent prior to meeting my spouse, um, I felt like I was not contributing to our marriage unit. I wasn't financially contributing. I was pretty miserable, so I wasn't like emotionally contributing. And um, I felt in complete limbo of what was going on in life. But what I realized is I had zero sense of purpose. I lost that sense of purpose and the sense of value that I had before I met him. Okay, so common theme here is that the circumstance changed, but what was the one commonality so far? Myself. Me. I was in my way. I'm the only thing that was constant in that entire um, situation. So in 2010, my spouse returns from a deployment. I go back to Colorado, and um, I um, met a military spouse. I was like, started dating, right? <laughs> started dating a military spouse. And um, she was somebody I liked. She reminded me of things that I enjoyed. Um, she was a photographer, and I loved dabbling in photography. And she was like, hey, you know, like, let's go out. We're just going to shoot the mountains and all this kind of stuff. And, and so I had my feet dug in just a little bit, you know, testing that waters. Like, can we really be friends? Will your husband like my husband? Like, I don't know how this is going to work out. Maybe we need to set them up on a date, you know. <laughs> and um, so we were kind of testing the waters. And, uh, and she really brought me out of my shell. It was one spouse who really changed what was happening for me. And so I get a job. And I start working, underemployed, but I started working. Um, and so I had something to do every day. Like I had somewhere to be, I had accountability, I had something to do. And, um, and then I decided, you know what, I'm going to go back to college and I'm going to pursue my master's degree. And so that's exactly what I did. And in 12 months, I went full time, I worked, and I got a master's degree. And so finally, I was really encouraged. I was really busy. And I was filling my time. My time was full. I mean, there was like no time left at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, I noticed life with my spouse was different. We were passing each other by. So he was coming home. I was leaving. He had military work that he was doing. I was doing school and work. And we were living with each other, but not really living with each other. Um, so I realized at that point, like, something has to change. I need to get out of my own way is the problem. Well, as soon as I decided I'm going to get out of my own way, we get orders. So now we're headed to California. And so I dreaded it because I was like, oh, I don't want to do this again. I finally met my person. You know, I went through the dating process of spouses. I found one. I'm hanging on to her, you know, and... Um, but we all know that's going to happen. It's only temporary. And so we had to, you know, go to California. So I get there. But let me tell you, I did something different this time. So I get to California. I attend my very first newcomer's briefing. Okay? So we've been on this journey a while here. I've never attended one. I go and attend a newcomer's briefing. I join the military spouse fellowship group. I reach out to the spouses club. I become a board member. I started my own business because I was struggling with employment there. Um, I was either going to have to drive to San Francisco or to Sacramento from where we were, and neither of those seemed really, you know, appealing to me to be in the car that long every day. And so I started my own business, and then I started helping military spouses start their own business and said, hey, you know what, you can do this. You can start a business from home. It's portable. You can take it with you, um, whatever it may be. So I lended my master's in business to fellow military spouses and said, here's how you do it. And I helped them get started. And then, um, and then I became a mom, and my world was rocked in California. I came a mom after five years of infertility treatment across three military bases and six miscarriages. So we lost six babies um, and finally became a mom in California. And so now we're this family of three. Everything seems like, hey, it's like coming together. It only took me like eight years to do this and it's finally coming together. And, um, and I found myself busy again, you know, but now I'm busy. I'm mom. I'm busy working from home, running a business. I'm busy helping spouses. And as you can see, I had my plate full with like this fellowship and board member of the spouses club. So I was, I was filling my time, but what was happening to me personally is I felt empty at the end of the day. I wasn't content like I was 
at 23 when I was going to work and I was content at the end of the day. So what happens next? Another deployment. Here comes another deployment, right? So this time I think to myself, you know what? I think I can stay in California. Nearest family is like 2,000 miles away and I was like, I, I can do this. You know, I've got a really good network. I'm involved. I know the resources. Um, but this little person inside said, you know what? You have a six-month-old baby and you're going to keep living this military life. Take the opportunity and go to Texas and let your baby know their family. So I moved. I moved to Texas. But this time, I was armed. I had armor with me. I had armor of resources. I had armor of a network. And I had armor of support groups. So when I went back to Texas this time, I was prepared for what was happening. Um, I stayed busy. And um, I was waiting like every day to get back to my base. So before, I was like, I just want to go home to Texas. Now I'm in Texas, and I'm like, I just want to go back to California. Like, and be with my people. Because what happened is over this eight year window, the friends, the family, the people that were my comfort, they no longer understood what was happening in my life. They didn't get um, what I was experiencing, challenges and obstacles. They tried, they cared, they wanted to. And at that time, I obviously wasn't good at relaying that message to them. So in 2014, we get back to California, and um, life was different. We're trying to reintegrate now, but as a family of three, because when my spouse left, he left a six-month-old. And then when he gets back, she's like 14 or 15 months old. And so um, I'm still working hard. I'm, I'm helping others. I'm raising you know, our daughter, filling my time again, staying very busy. Um, and the complaining that I was doing all those years and the feet being dug in, I realized weren't dug in so far anymore. And the complaining wasn't happening so much. More it was like, when are we going to get a new house? Because I'm ready to decorate again, you know? Um, that's what I was looking forward to. So I finally had a grasp on what was going on. But once again, that little inside, you know, voice was saying, you're not content. You're still not happy. And anybody in this room, how many of you wake up during the day and say, my goal today is to be absolutely miserable? <laughs> no, nobody? Okay, how many wake up and say, I just want to make it through this day and like be happy? Like, that'd be great. Yeah, pretty easy goals, right? That be, wanting to be happy is being content. You just want to be content with what's going on. Pretty much every person is on to the same destination of being content. It's the journey that you're going to take to get there that's going to look different. Okay? So we are back in California. Things are, you know, are okay. We're doing good. Orders are dropped again. Now we're going to Little Rock, Arkansas. And at the same time, I find out we're going to be a family of four. We're going to have another baby. So um, we're preparing to go to Arkansas, and we, we get our PCS. I'm pregnant, and wouldn't you know, right in the middle of the PCS, my beautiful baby boy decides he's going to come a month early, and we're going to detour, and I'm going to deliver in Texas, and our home goods are on a truck somewhere in the United States, and our house is not going to get closed on on time, so we're literally homeless, and um, February 16th, 2015 happens. So I'm in a hospital bed in Texas, and my husband actually was having to rush because we were in separate cars. You know you know how it goes. You got the separate cars, you're doing partial ditty, and you're just crazy, and you got a kid and animals, so you're trying to make this happen. So um, I'm waiting for him to get to Texas. Our baby's born, and it's a moment in my life that I will never forget, and it's the moment that my life changed forever. A doctor walked into the room and said, um, your son has Down syndrome. So everything in the room, because his birth was kind of traumatic, um, but everything in the room was moving, but I couldn't hear the voices of what people were saying. And the doctors kept coming in. So it's, your son has Down syndrome. Your son cannot hear. He is legally deaf. 
Your son cannot see. He will be blind. He has two holes in his heart. He has laryngomalacia and tracheomalacia, which means he can't breathe well. The flap in his throat would close on its own, and he'd just stop breathing. Um, and it just kept coming. Then it was, he has torticollis in one side of his neck. He has low muscle tone in his body. He has hip dysplasia. He may never walk. And the boulder was on me, and I couldn't breathe. And for the first time in my life, I feared everything. I feared how are we going to live a military life? How is my husband going to deploy? How am I going to single parent? How am I going to work a job? How am I going to run a business? How am I going to help fellow military spouses? I love to volunteer. That's gone. I felt everything in my life was ripped away and was thinking, we can't do this. So for the first time in my life, I found myself depressed. I didn't know what depression was until then. I found myself depressed, um, and it was a military spouse, a different one, who stepped into my life in that moment, who knew nothing about me, and she reminded me of a couple of things. One, she gave me permission. She gave me permission to feel the way I felt. And then she told me, you have absolutely everything you need. And at the moment, I was like, shut up. I don't want to hear what you're telling me. I don't because you're not in my shoes. Like, I was in a miserable place, guys. Um, but she said, you have everything you need if you will get out of your own way. That's a hard pill to swallow. And that's a hard look in the mirror to say, it's me. Once again, I'm the constant. I'm the one preventing what could happen, what needs to happen. And she became my accountability partner. And when I tell you it was a rough time, she would call me on the phone, because obviously my husband had to get back to work. She would call me on the phone and say, have you taken a shower today? No. Go turn the shower on and leave the phone on. I want to hear you get in the shower. OK. <laughs> you know, so I would go do it. And it was the person I needed. I needed that person to just pull me out of where I was, to show me that you could get back on path, to show me there was more than what I was living. And so I did. Um, I, I'm a fighter. I'm a researcher. It's in my nature. I'm a giver, and I'm a servant. That's just who I am as a person. And so what I did is I took all those fears, all those cans, every cans that I said, and I said, I'm going to turn my cans into cans. Looked in the mirror and said, I'm going to turn them into cans. And so that's what I did. I started journaling. I started reflecting. Um, I started giving myself words of affirmation. And I started changing my thoughts. And this is a big thing that I want to tell you. When you change your thoughts, you change your feelings, and you change your behaviors. It goes in that pattern. So change the way you think. It's going to change the way you feel. And it's going to change what you do. So in 2017 for me, I finally got out of my own way. Four very amazing military spouses nominated me for a very prestigious award, the Armed Forces Insurance Military Spouse of the Year Award. Um, these four spouses did something for me that I didn't know I needed in my life. And um, out of all of the nominations, I was selected. And I started traveling um, 2017 and 2018 with an opportunity to speak to military spouses, to share my story. Because what I would tell them is, just because you don't have a child with special needs who's literally coded on a table and have been told pretty much they're not going to be able to do anything, doesn't mean you're not going through something. And it's not that mine's more important to you. I'm looking at every one of you today to say what you are experiencing, the challenge that you have, the boulder on your shoulder, it's relative. They are relative to each other because the feeling that you feel is the same feeling that somebody else feels. Just because you don't think you need help doesn't mean you don't deserve that help. It's there. We have to ask for it. So one of the things through my year of traveling and speaking to military spouses is that I journaled what spouses would say. And I heard a lot of complaints, guys, a lot. 
And what I did is I took all of that and I went back through the journal and I highlighted words that kept coming up, things that spouses were experiencing, trying to overcome. And what I came to a conclusion is that the complaint was a um, surface level, but we wanted to get to the root problem. And the root problem was us, it was identity. We, at some point of this process as military spouses, lost who we are, what our purpose was, what our passion is, what we wanted to do, or we allowed our geographic location of where we were based, military life, to dictate how we were living our lives. It's very easy to say, I'm going to Guam so I can't work. Yeah, it's easy to say that. But you know what you could say instead? I'm going to Guam so I'm taking two years to focus on me. Change your thought. Change your feeling. Change your behavior. Okay? So one of the things I realized, doing, 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 doing. People who know me knew I was doing, doing, involved in everything, my hand in everything. Um, but through the MSOI program, I learned where I'm supposed to be. This is where I'm supposed to be. I have walked through things as a military spouse so that I can come and tell you, you are going to walk through them. You're going to go over it. You're going to go around it. You're going to go through it. You're going to go under it. But you're going to find a way because you have everything you need if you ask for it. We have an abundant amount of resources as military spouses. We just have to seek them because they're there. We have programs like the USO. We have in the Air Force a program that I just um, was introduced to this week. And I just left there this morning. And I'm going to finish with this because I know I have to go. But... I left the Air Force Wounded Warrior Program this week to come here. And what I saw was a warrior who is an expert um, rifleman who cannot do that anymore the way that he did it, but has learned to adapt, overcome, and get back to that expert marksmanship. And you know what? It just looks different. So if we can get in the mindset that everything that we're doing the job we wanted, whatever it is that we're passionate about, may just look different as a military spouse as it did, as it would have been before we became a military spouse. So, a couple of words. Life moments and challenges will happen, but it's up to you if you're going to um, allow those to dictate how you're going to live or if you're going to choose to live with passion and purpose. Find value in everything you do. Stay at home moms, you're valuable. Working moms, you are valuable. Same thing for dads. You are valuable. Working spouses and parents, volunteers, you have value in every single thing that you do every day. But you're the only person that has to believe that. So tell yourself every day. Words of affirmation. And it is okay to fail. Because when you fail, you grow. Through failure, you learn. And through failure, you show your strength. So, once again, big keynote here. You are the only thing standing in your way. Remember, filling your time is not the same as filling your cup. So don't waste your time with things that are not making you happy. And let's do something together. Let's find our color in this camouflage world. And I am challenging you, when you leave here today, to identify what makes you you, uniquely you. Thank you.